Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. Up front today, a history lesson from Georgia State Senator Julian Bond about black politics, past, present, and future. And in our Pause for Pride segment, Genevieve Stewart takes us to a hotel in New Orleans that is believed to have been the setting for the highly romanticized but much whispered about quadroom balls. I'm Rob Hinton, and we'll have those stories today on Folks. Everybody says folks. everyone and welcome to folks today we'll be continuing our month-long salute to black history up front we have excerpts from a recent lecture at LSU in Baton Rouge given by Georgia State Senator Julian Bond now there won't be a quiz following this lecture but I think you will find his thoughts on the future of black politics very interesting Julian Bond is a figure in black history himself in 1965 he was elected to the Georgia State Legislature but was prevented from taking his seat by other members who objected to his statements on the war in Vietnam in 1968, at the Democratic National Convention, he became the first black in history to be nominated for Vice President of the United States, but his age, 28, disqualified him for that post. At his lecture, Bond talked about the contributions of the late Martin Luther King Jr. to civil rights and black politics, and he shared his thoughts on what this country would be like today had King lived. Martin King would have been 56 years old had he been able to celebrate his birthday on January 15th. Had he lived, there's no real doubt our world would be different than it is. Because he did live when he did, we live today in a world a little less fearful than we might have, a world a little less filled with hate. And had he lived, he'd undoubtedly look at the world about him today with some considerable alarm. For although black Americans have won some considerable accomplishments in the years since Martin King died, the movement he led then appears to be in some disarray today. The gains he can claim some credit for having helped achieve seem in imminent danger of being destroyed. History is sure to record that this marvelous man was the premier figure in the 20th century struggle for economic and political justice. He was born in a world nearly as rigidly segregated by custom and by law as is South Africa today. Most black people south of the Mason-Dixon line were then only two generations away from slavery, a paycheck or two away from abject poverty. As a people, southern black people were generally politically impotent, educationally impoverished, economically bankrupt. Among this man's marvelous contributions were to give eloquent voice to the aspirations of black America, to give life to a method of mass participation in the struggle for civil rights so that everyone, student, housewife, minister, every man, every woman, could become an agent of their own deliverance. Bond also outlined the struggle of the civil rights movement during this century, and he said although some gains have been made, many conditions remain unchanged. In the 85 years of this century, the struggle waged by black Americans, including that period led by Dr. King, has passed through several climaxes. These have been years of great legal struggles in the courts, complemented by extra-legal struggles in the streets. In this period, we won gains at lunch counters and movie theaters, at bus stations, at polling places, 
and the fabric of legal apartheid in the United States began to be destroyed. What began as a movement for elemental civil rights quickly became a political and an economic movement, and black men and women began to win office and power in numbers we'd only dreamed of before. But despite an impressive increase in the number of black people holding public office, despite the ability we've now got to sit and eat and ride and vote and go to school in places that used to lack black faces, in a very real way in 1985, we find our condition unchanged. A quick look at all the statistics which measure either how well or how poorly a group of people are doing, the kinds of figures that measure infant mortality, median family income, life expectancy, these will demonstrate rather clearly that while our general condition has improved a great deal, our relative condition has actually managed to get worse. It's almost as if we were climbing a molasses mountain dressed in snowshoes, while everyone else rides a rather rapid ski lift to the top. Now the ski slopes are more treacherous, the molasses melting into mud, a sargasso sea of joblessness for many and hopelessness for many more. In such a climate, even gains won at great cost on yesterday soon become suspect. The bus front seat may lose meaning for people whose longest trip is likely to be from the feudal system of the rural south to the more mechanized, high-rise poverty of the North. The right to an integrated education may mean little to children bust from one ignorant academy to another. The right to register, the right to vote, this most precious of all rights, can lose meaning for people forced to choose between Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Bond says the 60s and the 70s provided a lot of hope for black America, but he added that a lot of that hope has been shattered by the Reagan administration. In 1976, black America went to the polls in record numbers to elect a man who clearly knew the words to our hymns. In less than a year, we wondered if he'd ever known the numbers on our paychecks. He lost office in 1980, and then, four years later, the people in their infinite wisdom spoke again. They've reinstalled the evil empire and re-elected an amiable incompetent who clearly intends to take the federal government entirely out of the business of enforcing equal opportunity. They intend to eliminate affirmative action for minorities and for women. They intend, in fact, to erase the laws and programs written in blood and sweat. In the 20 years since Martin King was the premier figure in black America, and a majority of Americans, both black and white, seem single-minded in pursuit of human freedom. They intend, if we let them, to turn back the civil rights clock until it becomes a sundial. For the first time since Richard Nixon was president, the actions of the Department of Justice are subject to the review and approval of the White House, to political intervention from powerful politicians. For example, the White House inserted itself into school desegregation litigation here in Louisiana and in Missouri, the latter action at the urging of that state's governor, Christopher Bond, no relation that we know. The Department of Justice, at the request of Senator Jeremiah Denton, removed the words white supremacy from a lawsuit against white supremacy in Mobile, Alabama. At the insistence of Senator Jesse Helms, the Department of Justice has agreed to an integration plan for North Carolina's public colleges that violates the standards set by the Department of Education. In school integration cases in Seattle, Norfolk, Nashville, and Chicago, the Justice Department shifted sides, in each instance reversing the position taken by their Democratic and Republican predecessors and supporting plans which will reinforce segregated schools. With increasing stridency, the Attorney General has attacked the federal courts for protecting the rights of minorities and of women. Twenty-four hours before a voting discrimination case involving the hometown of Senator Strom Thurmond was to come to court, the Justice Department switched sides. In civil rights generally, a retreat has been sounded. The government's forces leading the way toward the dismal, distant past. It is here their actions are most frightful. 
Their purpose is most sinister. Their design, a deliberate attempt to restore skin privilege and male dominance in American life. So in the years ahead, what's next for black politics? Bond shares his thoughts. Unfortunately, there is no utopia ahead. There are no roadmaps or detailed blueprints. But if we focus on the real issues, power, wealth, human need, we can move forward to a more humane society. Holding on to victories won only 20 years ago requires that no method and no means ought be discarded. Even one less valued now, appeals to conscience, justice, and fair play ought be employed. A people in extreme can't afford to turn their backs on any weapon which may produce the motive for doing right. Doing right, after all, is what this life is all about. Time now for our Pause for Pride segment, which today is filled with elegance. The story centers around the quadroon balls, and Genevieve Stewart recently visited a hotel in New Orleans where some of the balls are believed to have taken place. The Bourbon Orleans Hotel in New Orleans' French Quarter is a national historic landmark. These elegant walls house the famous Orleans Ballroom, site of the balls for New Orleans' gentry old guard society from 1800 to the Civil War. The famous Orleans Ballroom also had a rather infamous reputation as the site of the legendary, highly romanticized, much whispered about quadroon balls, or Les Ballets de Cordon Bleu. The Orleans Ballroom, its official name, was built at the turn of the century by John Davies, who spared no cost to construction. It was unparalleled as one of the great buildings of the day. Among its fine points were two wooden subfloors, hand-carved cypress wood moldings, imported crystal chandeliers from France, and its double descending staircase, which ladies in flowing gowns especially admired. The socially prominent held elegant balls here of every description, including the quadroon balls. Legend has it that the quadroon balls are where wealthy young blades of the period came to form romantic liaisons with mistresses of color. Polite society of the period pretended the balls didn't exist. Historians did not document them. And among Creoles of color, they were mentioned but only in the most hushed of tones. But legend also has it that more duels were fought over the beautiful quadroon women met at the balls than for any other reason. The quadroon balls were so named after the women who attended. Quadroon loosely means one quarter black blood. Clive Hardy, archivist at the University of New Orleans, conducted research on the quadroon balls and clarified the term quadroon. Well, that's mixed race, four parts. I mean, that. Uh, you had many, many gra gradations there. You had octoroons, quadroons, uh, mulattoes, griffs, and uh, I don't remember all of the terms, but it all had to do with what gradation of skin color a person had. And there are about a dozen different gradations there that I'm sure people who were uh, very sensitive to those things could say that's a griff, or that's a mulatto, or what have you. Uh, it just meant somebody of mixed race of so many parts. French and Spanish Creoles, although they owned slaves, were liberal in their racial attitudes. This began changing by the 1820s, which coincided the advent of the quadroon balls. As racism becomes an issue, you find the Creoles beginning to, well, they were frightened by the implications uh, that the Anglos brought with them. And I think many of them began to shy from any uh, uh, association with uh, their fellow Creoles who were black. Uh, and this becomes more and more apparent. I think you see symptoms of this early in the, well, for example, St. Louis Number 2, which was founded, I think, in 1818, 1820 in there. Uh, you see for the first time one section of that cemetery, it consists of three squares, one section is set aside for blacks or creoles. 
And this probably comes about, up to that time, there had been no distinction. There are black Creoles, there are blacks, and there are whites buried in St. Louis I, and probably in all of the other unknown cemeteries that are now long gone, what few there were. Uh, but probably what is happening already is that the church begins to feel the pressure of the Anglo-Saxon and his attitudes as they come in in greater and greater numbers. And by 1820, it's becoming something of a problem for everybody concerned, primarily because the Anglo-Saxon takes a very dim view of any, any contact with blacks other than as a, as a slave or as a menial. Uh, and that's where the problem begins. Thus, the quadroon balls were considered highly clandestine meetings this merely served to heighten the romanticized rumors about these liaisons between white men and free women of color. The quadroon balls were held here. As this town was a dancing town. People loved to dance, they loved music, but especially they loved to dance. That's one reason why this, this building was so popular in its early years, because they had balls continuously, night after night. And if it wasn't here, it was somewhere else. And these were often subscription balls. You paid 50 cents or you paid a dollar, depending on how uh, classy it might be, and you could be permitted in. And I'm sure that some of them were, were very elegant balls, uh, well-dressed gentlemen and ladies, and others were um, sort of just rough tumble places with a few fiddlers and uh, where fist fights were common enough and they had to call out the police and so on. Uh, they had white balls and they had mixed race balls and these are usually what are called the quadroon balls. The Orleans Ballroom is commonly considered the site of the quadroon balls, but since the balls were so controversial, respected historians of the period wrote little about them. In later writings, Hardy suspects that authors may have exaggerated both the elegant demeanor and locale of the balls. We know that they held them over on Condi at the Condi Ballroom. This is around the corner from here. And we know that they held them at, uh, I believe, the Globe Hall and a number of other halls. There is no evidence that historians have found, in particular Dr. Tragel, who is probably looked at more uh, newspapers and diaries and journals and what have you of that period for this area. There is no evidence that can be found, he could not find it and I could not find it, that this locale was ever the scene of a quadroon ball. Now we know that there were balls here, but that this locale ever had a quadroon ball, we do not know. Uh, however, in, in the popular mythology, the tour drivers love to point this building out as a site of the quadroon balls and so on. Well, they, there were several sites for these things, but this was probably not one because we probably would find some evidence over after all of these years. None has been found. Uh, we also know from serious research that these things, while some of them may have been quite elegant and very well mannered, these balls. Most of them were probably pretty rough affairs, uh, particularly the interracial ones. They, uh, I think it was Dr. Tragel who said that they resembled nothing so much as an interracial orgy uh, with uh, quite wild brawling and what have you. Often the police were called out several times. They, the city council would threaten to close down these dance halls and so on because uh, uh, the people that frequented them were uh, often a rough lot. Uh, and I don't mean fine gentlemen going out with swords or pistols and all of the formalities and so on, but these were sort of people that settled their arguments uh, with a bottle over the head or something, uh, knocking each other down. Hardy further shoots down the romanticized theory that the majority of the quadroon mistresses were kept in style and financial security by wealthy suitors. There were certainly um, what were called placides, uh, uh, women who were kept by, by wealthy men. 
This was uh, probably common enough if, if a man had money. Yeah, I'm quite certain that he never discussed this at home with his wife or anything like that. She probably knew. I mean, many of them probably were not so naive as we're led to believe, but she probably never mentioned it. Uh, there were men who undoubtedly had kind feelings for these women, uh, in addition to whatever sensual pleasures they may have received. Undoubtedly, some bond was formed there. Uh, if they were wealthy, they no, uh, no doubt in some cases placed money on them, gave them money, gave them stock, gave them property, maybe gave them the house, or at least left it to them in their will or something of this nature, or perhaps just bought it outright for them and gave it to them, uh, as men still do if they, if they can afford that sort of thing. I suspect that uh, that was only a small fraction, though, of what went on in that, of that sort, because after all, like uh, all people, the Creoles, had limited funds also, maybe even more limited than many of the Anglo-Saxons. The notorious beauty of these Creole mistresses was well documented. One can certainly speculate that they ignited the jealousy of many wives. They were interested in a good time, they knew good food, they loved to dance, they loved to party, but uh, the women were usually not too well educated, the women were noted for their vivacious manner, for their flirting, for their charm, but almost all travelers of any substance would come away saying, but there was nothing there uh, behind any of this. Children born of these conjugal affairs did create ties and relationships among whites and blacks. Myth is born true in that some of the resulting children were well-educated. Many of these people uh, those black Creoles, like their white counterparts before the Civil War, who were free and who had wealth, and of course that was a fairly small class as compared to the great number of Creoles who were poor or tradesmen and uh, lower class, uh, those Creoles, black and white, tended to send their children if they uh, had the means to, to uh, find schools or to convents in the case of a girl to be educated and boys sometimes to Paris. Indeed, I would suspect that this was truly a mark among upper class black Creoles at that time to send a child to Paris uh, for a French education and so on. When publicly referred to, these relationships were embarrassing to aristocratic men, as Bernard de Marigny discovered in 1845 when he tried to legalize the vote for free men of color. We know that he did make that proposal that uh, free blacks, that the legislature be permitted to give them the franchise, in other words, make them citizens. Uh, we also know that during the discussion of this bill, he must have caused a good deal of consternation in the Constitutional Convention when he pointed around the room and said, uh, I could very, uh, not pointed around the room, but he said, I could very easily mention names here were I so inclined, but that would be impolite. Uh, indeed, it is rather funny to me to hear some of you uh, castigating these blacks who uh, you are related to. Uh, but he said, I will not do that. And I'm sure at that point, people must have been ready to go under the table. Uh, it would have been rather embarrassing. Skeptics wonder how these sensuous balls and affairs could have taken place for 30 years during the height of slavery. But New Orleans blacks of the period had a relative degree of freedom. There is the stereotype of the uh, black as a servile individual uh, cowering, holding his hat, and uh, stepping off the banquet as a fine white gentleman walked by. Uh, this was not true in New Orleans before the Civil War. Uh, you had a great number of blacks in this city, tremendous number. Uh, many of them were slaves, owned by white people. You also had a large free black, a relatively large free black population. And all evidence is that these people were not servile, that they 
were pretty much on their own as long as they brought the payment home to master, who they worked for, if they were rented out or something, and they'd pay him his percentage. Uh, very little control was kept over these people. They often hung around on street corners in saloons. Uh, they were often quite rowdy. The police would have to be called out. Uh, they often would threaten the white man as quickly as anyone else. Uh, they weren't servile. I Whether one chooses to believe the more romanticized myths or the more historically accurate versions, there is a fascinating mystique about the quadroom balls that one can't ignore. The Bourbon Orleans Hotel took painstaking efforts in restoring the Orleans Ballroom and is renaming it the Quadroon Ballroom. The ballroom has been experiencing a renaissance of use back to the splendid social affairs of its prior use. Although the purpose of the Quadroon Balls is of a sensitive nature, it is a colorful part of our history and a reason to pause for pride. Well, that's our program for this week. Thanks for watching. I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you to take a moment this week to write us and let us know what you think about folks. Write us at 2618 Wooddale Boulevard, Baton Rouge, 70805. We're anxious to hear from you. Our celebration of Black History Month continues next week, and we hope that you'll join us. See you then. Bye-bye. Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB.